last week, Reverend Shannon taught us that we are filled with God's substance. God substance. That was a word that the old time New Thoughters used a lot. And it's something we don't talk about much these days, the substance of spirit. I love that. We are filled with God's substance. She, she taught us that healing, connection, uh, sacred listening, dream building, all of this is a co-creation with the divine. Today, I'd like for us to take a deeper look at this idea of God, substance, and co-creation, and what it actually means for us. And I'm going to give you a hint here. It has everything to do with the nature of power itself, and empowerment is all about how we apply this understanding. So that's what we're about this week. A few days ago, I received a phone call in the afternoon from a very dear friend um, who has had a very difficult uh, divorce journey. It has been um, years and years, um, but they co-parent, and the co-parenting hasn't been easy. So this week, they were going back to court to work on a parenting plan to get something in writing that everybody could agree to. And she called me to ask for prayer before the court the following day. So we prayed. I don't know what I said, because that's what happens when I pray. I leave, and something else takes over. Um, but she called me again later that evening, and she said, you know, Shell, I'm really struck by something you said. And I said, what, what was that? <laughs> and she said... Um, in your prayer, you talked about how there's my way and there's Rick's way, but there's always a third way. And that when we can find the third way, often that's where we can find God. And she, I didn't remember saying that for the record, so I take zero credit for the wisdom. But we started talking about this concept, and as we were talking, she realized that she had been holding on so tightly to her way of what she was convinced would be best for the children, that it had never even occurred to her that there could be another way that would serve them as well. She was in the energy of battle, and she was in the energy of fear, because she didn't want to lose a minute with those precious children. Not a minute. I understand that. I also understand he also was in the energy of battle and the energy of fear and didn't want to miss a minute with his precious children. So we prayed again, went to bed. I woke up at 6 in the morning, and I was already praying for her. Do you ever do that? You ever wake up and you find out you're already praying in your sleep? or singing in your sleep, or something that you're learning. Like uh, back when I was learning a foreign language, I would wake up and I was having a conversation in my sleep in the foreign language, you know? Like prayer, in some ways, is like another language for us to learn. It's the same process in a lot of ways. So I woke up at 6 a.m. I was already praying for the whole family, you know, N not just my friend, but for all of them. And I just texted her, you know, prayers on your day. And um, she called me at one o'clock and she was in shock. Like she had no emotion in her voice. And she goes, the judge found the third way. I said, what do you mean? She said, Rick presented his case, I presented my case, and the judge f from a distance and with less information was able to look at the situation and find a third way that was better for everyone. The judge found the third way. And I was thinking about how if God is in creation, if all of creation is actually co-creation with the divine, there is no creation that can happen outside of God. So I was thinking about how if Julie had gotten her way, there would have been God in it. And if Rick had gotten his way, there would have been God in that too. Because this new creation can't happen outside of the divine. 
But when we are able to open up to that third way, release a little bit of that control, then God can show up in whole new glorious ways that we hadn't even imagined. A very wise woman said to me years ago, she said, every time I am stuck in the either or, the best thing I can do for myself is look for the third way because it opens up possibility. The divine is always found in possibility. So God is in the either and God is in the or. But as Reverend Shannon taught us last week, if God is creation itself, then our work is choice and God's work is in creation. So in the case of Julie and Rick, the judge was the one who was empowered to make the choice of what direction that God's substance would mold itself into, right? Because nothing can be created without God. But so, so often in this life, when we can step back, there's a better outcome. I was thinking about how those of you who've taken prayer classes with us, y'all, there's no right way to pray. There's no wrong way to pray. But you might notice that around here, sometimes there's a way that we pray that is very logical and orderly of invoking the divinity within us and then directing the substance in the direction that we want to go. But here's the thing. We don't pray for outcomes. It would have been malpractice if I had prayed for Julie that she got her way. That would have been malpractice on my part. What we pray for is qualities. I prayed for peace. I prayed that her children would experience love and safety. I prayed for comfort for my friend in whatever the outcome was. You see, we pray for the qualities that we want to experience, not for the outcome that we think will be best. And when we can pour ourselves and surrender into the qualities of life that we want to experience, then that's the first step in making ourselves available to the third way, the way that God would have for us. You see, if I had prayed for a certain outcome, because I believe in prayer, I believe that that outcome might have happened and it wouldn't have been the highest good for all. We pray for the highest good for all. Believe it or not, this is going to be hard to believe. I don't always know what that is. I know. Hard to believe, isn't it, husband? I think I know. I want to know. But this is what we do. We get in trouble because we're trying to control that substance. We're trying to form it into our little ideas, our ego ideas, our limited thinking of what safety looks like ideas. You see, we're trying to mold all of that power and all of that possibility into limitation. And that's how we get ourselves into trouble. The best thing that we can do is to be willing to co-create with the divine. And control and co-creation are not the same thing. What do we mean by that? Brian, how many years have you been playing piano? 50 plus years. Brian has been playing piano and he has technique unlike anything I have seen elsewhere. He has mad skill and control over his fingers. He has mad control over the tone, over how hard he hits the keys so that the piano makes a certain sound. He has mad control. But when he starts playing music, it's no longer about control. It's about creation. And all of that work that he has done to build that technique over the years, it kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, it takes a back seat to the creativity that starts to move through his body and into the world. There's a difference between control and creation. If I asked him to come up here and do a scale in D sharp, 
with a minor seven, he would do that even though it would make no sense. <laughs> right? It's a, oh, thanks. <sighs> it made sense. He could do that because he has the control and the knowledge to direct the music that way. But if I asked him to come up here and to um, improvise a shuffle so that Adrian could improvise a melody on his guitar, they would, put the, they would use the technique, but the technique would take a backseat to the creation. So what does that have to do with you? who may not be master musicians the way they are. It's the same thing in our lives. We hold on so tightly trying to control, control, control. And when we're trying to hold on to what we have, what we're doing is we're shutting down all of the avenues that the divine has in our lives. We are shutting down all of the ways that spirit can speak to us about the third way. And so control and creation, although they can inform each other, they do not belong together. So every single one of us has had an experience in life where we have felt utterly certain about something. You have known this was the right decision to make. It might have been what school to go to or what person you want to marry. Never regretted that decision. Uh, it might be um, what, uh, what toenail polish you want. <laughs> it can be anything, but all of us know what that feeling of utter certainty feels like. Can you remember a time in your life where you have felt utterly certain about something? This is the book I need to read. This is a class I need to take. That's always a big one for me because I'm a lifelong learner. I'm like, oh. Got to take that class. Oh, shoot, I got to take another class. <laughs> Yay, I get to take another class. What's a time in your life when you have felt utterly certain about something? I want you to hold that in mind for just a minute. Utter certainty. How does it feel? How does it feel in your mind? How does it feel in your body? this memory of being utterly certain about something. For those of you who are sensitive to energy, feel your body about two inches, you know, outside of your body field. Can you feel certainty there? Some of you can, right? But whether you feel it in your mind or in your heart or in your body or in your energy, it's all the same thing. That feeling of certainty is the substance of spirit trying to direct you, helping to show you what's possible in your lives. And being acquainted with this feeling is one of the most beneficial byproducts of having a spiritual practice, right? It's that ability to feel that certainty you know, when I look at the clock, I'm like, do I have time for an extra story? I have to tell you this story. I have to tell you this story. Um, I have four children, and every single one of them are strong-willed little devils. No offense, John. You grew up real well. They all have grown up so beautifully and wonderfully. Um, but they are, they are all intelligent, and they know what they want, um, which makes for a really fun three-year-old experience. I'll just lay that down right now. And one of my children, um, I was tired. I wasn't sleeping well. And um, my child wanted something. And I couldn't give it to her in that moment. And she melted. And when I say melted, I mean more like exploded in my general direction. And in that moment, I literally felt something come over me. And I didn't get mad at her. I didn't get upset that this experience was happening. All I felt was unconditional love for this little being that was having a rough five minutes. And I got on my knees and I held my arms like this and she ran into my lap and she just melted into me. And in that place of surrender, we were both able, at three years old, she was already reading, this is how precocious this child was, 
uh, we were both able to surrender and have a conversation about what her needs were, what my needs were, and where we could meet in the middle, right? Most of the time, as a mom, I couldn't react that way. I had my own needs that I was too embedded in, right? But something came over me that was utter certainty in that moment of what that child needed. And because I was able to follow that third way, not her way, what she wanted, not my way, what I wanted, but because I was in the certainty of the third way, we were, we were able to be at peace together and to be loving together, to be kind together, the third way. The feeling of certainty is one of the ways that this God substance speaks to you, through you, and as you, and being acquainted with it is so important. Because when we're feeling uncertain, that is our cue that we haven't seen the right way yet. We haven't seen the third way yet. We feel uncertain because we haven't accessed the divine solution that is right there waiting to be made manifest. You know, before they went to court, Julie felt absolutely certain about what her children needed. But when we examined it later that night, she wasn't certain, she was afraid. And sometimes certainty, no, sometimes fear is all dressed up like certainty, right? Sometimes fear puts on a coat and says, this is the way it's got to be. This is the way. And so clinging to a story of what we think is best is not the same thing as clarity, it's not the same thing as certainty. The trick here, I believe, is being able to take enough of a step back to recognize the difference between the voice of fear on one side and the voice of divinity on the other. Here are a few clues. The voice of fear is always concerned about safety or control or keeping the status quo. The voice of divinity is concerned with love with truth, with the capital T, and always, and this is key, the voice of the divine always has the highest good for all in it. The highest good for all. That is key in telling the difference between the voice, voice of fear and the voice of divinity. The voice of God is the voice of truth. It is the voice of life speaking itself through you. Ernest Holmes once wrote, amidst the din and uproar of our lives, the accumulated fear, doubt, and confusion of the ages, there has always been and always will be a still small voice within that seeks to proclaim itself through us. Life has given us all we could ever desire. It is up to us to decide and discover for ourselves what the nature of life is and to accept it. To decide and discover for ourselves what the nature of life is and to accept it. So, what do you think? What do you think the nature of life is? What do you think one of the gifts of this teaching is that nobody is going to tell you what to believe. Reverend Shannon and I and other teachers here are going to offer you tools to access your own understanding. We are going to offer you practices to access your own experience of the divine. But we are never, ever going to tell you what to believe. We will share freely about what we believe. And sometimes it's different. That's why I love when we have conversations and we can talk about how we see things differently sometimes. We will share with you freely about what the sages of the ages believe. But you're the only one, only you, can decide for yourself what the ultimate nature of reality is. 
We will never require you to believe as we do, adopt the same practices that we do, pray or meditate the same way. The great gift of this teaching is that it is an invitation for you to come to your own understanding. We aren't trying to give you a belief system. We're trying to encourage a relationship. A relationship with life with unconditional love and access to your own consciousness and highest wisdom, a relationship with all that is good and holy in the world. So what do you believe? What do you believe? The nature of life, of love, of the divine. What do you actually believe? And can you accept it? After years of study and contemplation and complication and struggle and growth and learning and suffering, I can say with all sincerity that I believe that the nature of the divine is love itself. Love itself and a creative law that automatically and literally makes life happen. Love and creative law. And when I was able to come to terms with that, when I was able to come to terms with the fact that this love, this creative impulse of the divine is what animates me and all of life, then I began to understand my own nature as well and the nature of all of life. And then life no longer becomes a struggle to reconcile the either or. Everything changes. Instead of that suffering and that struggle, life becomes an opportunity for connection and growth with yourself, with each other, with the divine. And when I'm in relationship with this love, the third way, it automatically asserts itself in my life. Emmett Fox, one of my favorite old-time teachers, wrote, the root of all difficulties is a lack of the sense of the presence of God. Notice he doesn't say the root of all difficulty is the absence of God. How could that be? God can never be absent because it is infinite. The energy of love that is the divine is infinite. The root of all difficulties is our own lack of the sense of the presence of the divine. The sense of the presence of the divine. We have forgotten to open our eyes and see. We have forgotten to reach out our hands and feel. We have forgotten to sense the presence of the divine. That's the root of all difficulties. This is recovery month. This also, yesterday, was National uh, Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Awareness Day. And um, I want to tell you that the reason I talk about our family's um, journey with muscular dystrophy is because I want you to know when I stand here and I say with all certainty that there is a God of love that is everywhere present right where you are all the time and has never left you. When I say that, I want you to know I'm not saying that from some place of airy, fairy, magical, wishful thinking, um, crossing my fingers and hoping it's true. I have hard things in my life. I have suffering in all the places I haven't yet found the presence of God, <laughs> you know? And this is why I want to talk to you about it because we all can learn from each other how we meet these times from that place of love. How do we meet a diagnosis with a willingness to find the third way of the divine? You know, sometimes some of these diagnoses can appear to be very either or, can't they? Yeah. But when I remember, when I remember, when I remember, when I remember to open all that I am 
to open my eyes and my hands and my heart to that presence of the divine, that God's substance, that yes, is absolutely in Alex, in every person that touches his precious body, and yes, also in the diagnosis. When I remember, then I can remember that God is here too. God is here too. God is in all of it. And the suffering happens because I have forgotten. So our invitation this week is to remember, to remember, to remember. And when we look for God, when we look for that God substance that we know is in there somewhere, we can't say God is infinite and then say, except in this. Okay, I do sometimes, Kate, but I shouldn't, right? And it's in those exceptions when we catch ourselves. That's the invitation this week, is to catch ourselves when we are trying to make exceptions for God. There is no God and there is no exception. The opportunity is to notice the places where we are holding on to a diminished view of life. It could be an either or or a limitation of some kind that we are perceiving in life or that has been laid upon us. But our job is to notice when we are in that place and to look deeper, to look for love and to open to creativity and be willing to find a new path, to be willing to open ourselves to the third way, a new way of being, to notice the places where we might be holding on so tightly that we can't reach out for God. And to come to a place of, if not surrender, <laughs> maybe we can come to a place of um, ease. Let it be easy. Let it be graceful. Let it be loving. Let it be good. Let it be God.